So yeah, welcome. My name is Sam Hurst and the talk today is on horror, race and romance. Um, so just to introduce me and what I'm bringing to the talk today, I am an 18th century, so I look at theology and literature. Um, I do interdisciplinary work in history and literature, and I particularly focus on sort of the Regency period to some extent, but the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, we are, of course, going to be talking about race today, so it's worth positioning myself. I'm a white uh, British scholar. I'll be sort of bringing in the British angle, but I can't do this from a, a subject position of knowledge. So um, I'm going to try and be nuanced and sensitive in the way in which I'm dealing with the themes. But if there are any things you'd like to bring up, please feel free to do so in the chat or privately with me after by emailing me or contacting me. So Tanagra, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, I'm Tanagra G or Tanagra G G N O C. I've been working in film predominantly in horror and the genre for approximately eight years. I'm usually a fan of horrific romance um, and today we're going to be touching on that a little bit but I'm also just in general a romance fan. Um, I, as Sam is doing the British side of this discussion I'll be predominantly covering the um, US side and the history that goes into that so really excited. Thank you very much. Uh, so I also should know I too am a romance fan. <laughs> so one of the reasons that we want to do it, we do work with horror and romance, both of us, and uh, we wanted to look at kind of how these three things are going to be uh, panning out in the three texts that we're looking at today. And we also thought, you know, there's been a lot of romance criticism recently coming from non people who aren't in that world of uh, romance reading or criticism. So we thought it'd be good to do it from that perspective. So we're going to be talking about three texts today. The first of them is uh, Bridgerton, the 2020 Netflix show. We're going to be talking about the 1992 Candyman and the 2017 Get Out. Um, and you're going to see, hopefully, as we go along, how these are tied together. Um, but let me give you a kind of brief overview of the structure that we're going to be looking at. And we're going to be sharing the presenting between us. The first section, um, I'm going to be doing the uh, sort of knowledge input for you. So in terms of thinking about Bridgerton, we're going to be placing it within sort of this connection to the history of the period. So we're going to be having a look at black history in Regency England. Um, then we're going to be thinking about the issues of race and world building as they appear in Bridgerton. And we're going to be problematizing and looking at the relationship between the two leads, um, thinking about rape, race and power. Um, so the way that we're structuring each of these sections is slightly different to usual. We're going to have an input session from uh, predominantly one of us. Uh, it's me for Bridgerton, it's Tanagra for Get Out and it's both of us for Candyman. Um, then we're going to have a discussion between the two of us. Um, so I do recommend you put your screen, if you can, on single view. Uh, you should have the option at the top of your screen, um, or you can do it when we come out of screen share, so that you're seeing whichever one of us is speaking at the time. Um, and then we will open it up to questions from you and discussion with you guys. So we'll have input, then we'll have discussion between the two of us, then discussion with you. Um, so in Candyman, the input will be, uh, tonight we're talking about anti-black propaganda in the US. I'll be kind of tying that into these racist ideologies and interracial relationships and how we see those similar ideas reflected in the UK. Um, and then Tanagra will be going back to thinking about contemporary politics, white saviors, and then we will be discussing aspects of the film to do with this kind of the concept of the white savior and also the relationship looking at love and monstrosity in relationship to the film. And then finally, we're going to be looking at Get Out. Uh, the input with Tanagra is going to be about red flags in contemporary race relations. Um, then we're going to be looking at the film and thinking about weaponizing white femininity and relationships as the locus of horror. So there's a lot that's going to be going on today. Um, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to sort of uh, engage with the discussion. Um, it's a little bit experimental, the format, the input and then the discussion and the open questions. But it worked quite well this morning. So we'll see how it goes this evening as well. So let me uh, start with this idea of black history in Regency England. So when we're talking about adaptations um, or work set in the period, in this historical period, like Bridgerton, it's important to kind of understand how these relate to the actual history of the period. Now, there's a number of misconceptions about history in the period in regards to race. And I'm just going to go through a few of these at the beginning to make sure that we have in mind that these are misconceptions. And so we're putting them to one side as we discuss some key, some key figures. <clears throat> 
So one of the kind of overwhelming points of view that you'll quite often hear is the idea that everyone in England is white. And quite a lot of uh, period dramas, quite a lot of romance novels depict an England which is either predominantly or totally white. Um, now, this is not accurate uh, to the discussion of the period at all, really, um, particularly if we're looking at major metropolis, uh, major metropolis like London or major port cities like Liverpool, Bristol. Um, you're looking at a society which has a significant multicultural element. Today, we're going to be concentrating on Black Britons, but there was uh, sort of people from other uh, areas of the empire and of the world as well. Um, but by the 1780s in England, you had a population um, of approximately 20,000 Black people living in London. So they were a part of the everyday life uh, of the capital and of England in a variety of different positions and jobs. Um, so another misconception, um, so some of these misconceptions are mutually exclusive, some of them tie in together, but another misconception was the idea of Britain in this period as an oasis of freedom. So the quote that many people will have heard is this idea of England was too pure an air for a slave to breathe in. Um, and this is often attributed to the 1772 Somerset case, which um, uh, Lord Mansfield made a judgment in that case, which essentially meant that um, if that slaves could not exist in England, theoretically, um, so that you had this idea that once you came to England, you were automatically freed. Um, the quote itself, though, actually relates back to the 16th century and to a similar court case in Elizabethan England. So that should kind of highlight the fact that whatever the law was, there perhaps wasn't uh, quite this air of freedom within the British um, land. And you have examples from the period, so some of the famous narratives that have been written and published uh, by Black people at the time, like that of Oladu Equiano or Mary Prince, um, kind of highlight the ways in which, although theoretically people were free, that didn't always manifest in practice. So Oladu Equiano was essentially forcibly removed by the person who uh, had bought him um, to the West Indies against his will after being in England. And we also have uh, Mary Prince, who was brought to England by her um, employers or slash owners, um, as they conceived of themselves to be still while they were in England. Um, and they basically kept taunting her saying, well, leave then, well, leave, um, despite the appalling treatment. Um, and they were relying on the fact that she didn't have the support networks or ability to find employment or financial support in, to enable her to leave. Um, so we need to take this with a pinch of salt and we also need to put it in the broader context of the British Empire in relation to the slave trade of the period. We don't have the end of the slave trade legally until the mid 19th century in England. And even uh, at the end of the slave trade, those structures are still often uh, reproduced through, for example, for example, the apprenticeship schemes and uh, indentured servitude in the West Indies. Um, so we do need to be uh, careful about thinking of this idea of Britain as an oasis of freedom. That simply wasn't really the case. Having said that, the other sort of end of the spectrum is thinking about black British people in the period only through the lens of slavery and only as enslaved people. Um, now, this also wasn't accurate. We have a diversity um, of different uh, nationalities in England at the time, but we have black people in a variety of different professions, roles, and having very different social statuses as well. So the situation is much more diverse and much more complicated than people are often willing to engage with or accept. Um, the other sort of misconception that's worth tackling is this idea that there's been constant progress in terms of diminishing legal and societal prejudice in relationship to race. Now, this, this idea um, isn't related simply to race, but the idea that we're always moving forward in an arc of progression. And our current point is, for example, the least racist in every way that has ever been, is obviously simply not true. We have to understand as well the construction of ideas of race exactly as that, as constructions. And if we're looking at sort of uh, 16th, 17th and 18th century Britain, we're seeing uh, the development of sort of proto-eugenesis speech, we're seeing the development of understandings of race being produced in relation to the need to justify or the attempt to justify uh, the slave trade. Um, and there are some sort of differences between how uh, black people were conceived of in the 18th century and how they would be conceived of today. And in many ways, it's more horrific. So you have that 
uh, widespread dehumanization. But you also um, have examples which don't fit in with that and which challenge our conceptions of the period. Uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about is the way that interracial relationships were understood. And they were relatively widespread in the 18th and early 19th century among the British um, lower classes, among the lower classes in Britain. Um, so to sort of uh, understand this kind of arc of progress um, is actually kind of diminishing some of the complexity of the period and the ways in which things go get worse and then better and worse and better. So uh, having sort of thought about that general overview and those misconceptions, I'm just going to give a sort of a little bit of a look at black society at the time um, in uh, England and some of the kind of range of diversity that we're getting. Um, so first of all, a little bit of a, uh, a backward step. Um, I'm not trying to suggest that Regency England or 18th and 19th century England is the start of a black British population or a settled black British population because that simply isn't true. We can go back to Tudor England and find black, uh, free black people in England in a variety of professions and I've got a number of them there. Um, so seamstress, diver, servant, free woman, cottager, porter, silk weaver, mariner. Um, and you can see in the picture here, we have John Blanc. Um, I don't know if you can see him, uh, this is him here. Um, from the early 1500s um, and he was a trumpeter at the royal court of Henry. So you have uh, got sort of black people, black figures already a settled population um, in the time of the sort of 1500s. Um, and two books that I recommend sort of getting if you're interested in this history is David Olasogo's Black and British, which looks kind of at the sweep of history, um, and the Black Tudors, more particularly by Miranda Kaufman, which looks at this period particularly. But let's get back to the 18th and 19th century. And the examples that I'm looking at and choosing here are connected to Bridgerton in the sense that I'm trying to look at uh, the same areas of society that Bridgerton uh, looks at and see if... Uh, well, have a look at the actual diversity that existed in the period in these areas. So how do we find out about black history in the 18th and 19th century in England? The first port of call is always going to be the writing of black writers. Um, and we have many narratives, often ex-slave narratives. Um, one of the earliest of these is Ignatius Sancho's 1780 posthumously collected letters. Now he also wrote plays, he also wrote poetry. Um, but these letters were published after his death. Now Ignatius Sancho had been um, a slave and then a servant and then uh, a businessman, um, a, quite a successful shop owner <coughs> and also a man of letters. Um, you have people like Otto Bacoguano, whose thoughts and sentiments on the evil and wicked traffic of slave and slavery and commerce of the human species was a key text in the abolitionary movement. It didn't do a great deal of good. It was published and it was uh, given to the government and to the king who basically ignored it. Uh, you also have figures like Eladio Equiano, um, who had a very uh, sort of diverse life. He was kidnapped as a child. He was sold uh, to a man in the Navy. He served in the British Navy. He was then forcibly removed from England. He uh, lived in the West Indies for a long time. He became a, a merchant there. Um, he returned to England and became a sort of political activist, uh, writing down the life of Aladu Equiano as well. And married um, a, Brit a white British woman and settled down um, in uh, the British countryside, essentially. Um, then we also have sort of the 1830s. We have Mary Prince as another example of these narratives. Um, and I mentioned her as well. She was she was brought to England uh, with her fam with the family that um, owned her and employed her in England, theoretically. Um, and left them with the help of abolitionist movements. So this is kind of our first port of call, but not everybody was writing their own stories. And it's also worth noting here, and bear in mind the idea of it's not a curve of progress that's always on going upwards, because what we have with Ignatius Sancho, one of the first, is we have him writing a variety of different types of texts. But and as the abolitionary movement grew in the 1780s and 1790s, we're seeing quite a lot of black authored texts, but those which are gaining support and being published are quite often related uh, to slave narratives, essentially, uh, essentially, and to slavery. 
So these are the stories that white people and white abolitionists were interested in telling and interested in promoting. You have a quite extreme example of that with Mary Prince, which was heavily edited by Thomas Pringle. Um, but it is a sort of more general point that these are the life stories that people wanted to hear or the abolitionists wanted to hear. And there is that sort of white control of black voices. But there are lots of black lives um, that are worth looking at. Um, or well, all the black lives of the period are worth looking at, but are worth sort of pulling out as examples um, of different uh, diverse black lives in the period. So I'm going to be looking at the beginning at sort of upper class uh, black people. Um, so one of the examples, one of the most famous examples is Julius Sabisse, and you can see a picture of him here. Um, he was a macaroni, uh, which is a sort of very, very highly fashionable dandy type. Um, not quite accurate, but if you don't know the period, that's a, that's a good enough description, I think, to, to get an idea of who he was. He moved um, in very high society because as a child, he was sold to the Dutch, or he was gifted to the Duchess of Queensbury, and uh, she raised him... Uh, sort of as an adopted son. Um, he became her fencing master, as you can see from the picture here. Um, as I say, moved in high society, was a member of uh, the London Ton, essentially, um, and uh, eventually moved, uh, had to leave to India for, for some scandal, which is not quite clear. Um, he set up a fencing and riding academy there and then died uh, after falling off a horse. Um, so, you know, if we're thinking about the depiction of uh, black people within the upper classes, we have examples to work from uh, that bear in mind kind of the issues of uh, race and class uh, that were apparent at the time. So another example of this kind of uh, move to a sort of upper class status is that of Caesar Picton, who was a slave and then a servant, and then he became a coal merchant and eventually a master fortune significant enough to become and uh, be counted as a gentleman in the register. Um, in terms of women, the most famous black woman, obviously, sort of within that upper class society was Dido Elizabeth Bell, um, who uh, was the illegitimate daughter um, of a naval officer. Um, and she lived um, in the house of her great uncle, Lord Mansfield, uh, with her cousin, Lady Elizabeth Murray. And you might recognize her from the film, Bell. Um, Although she was a member of the family, she was a sort of second class member of the family, but she lived um, within that society, eventually married, had children um, and married a steward. Uh, another sort of interesting example of black women in the period that's just worth mentioning, I think, um, is William Brown. Uh, so whether uh, William Brown would identify as a woman uh, or as a man, uh, had uh, dressed as a man in order to be a sailor or lived as a man more broadly, uh, she, uh, they were uh, on the Queen Charlotte, we have them registered on the Queen Charlotte um, as a landsman, but there's also a debate about whether the, it was the same William Brown who was registered as an able-bodied seaman as well, a position of significant responsibility. Of course, there were a lot of black sailors in the period, and Olado Equiano is another example of that. Now, again, I'm tying it back to Bridgerton. In Bridgerton, we obviously have the example of the black boxer, Will, and his wife, Alice. And black boxers were a feature of the boxing scene in England, a well-known feature of the boxing scene. So we have figures like Bill Richmond, who um, was a boxer himself, and then a trainer, and then a publican. So he lived in Yorkshire, married a white woman, and was the subject of various sort of racialized attacks in which he ended up fighting back realizing that he was a very good fighter, moved to London, became a fighter, and then met Tom Molyneux. Um, and he took on training Tom Molyneux, who was one of the most famous boxers of his time uh, that engaged in this sort of epic fight that was the subject of multiple popular ballads between him uh, and the white British man, uh, Crib. Um, now, Bill Richmond became a publican, and that's an interesting point to draw out because a number of black men in the period did become publicans. They owned uh, inns, essentially. Um, and you do have this sense of black communities around these uh, inns and also a sort of black nightlife. And you've got some really interesting accounts in the 18th century of black celebrations that go into hundreds of people celebrating together, things like the Somerset case. So you had uh, black people were public figures in the 18th and uh, 19th century England. So this idea, if you're producing a Regency novel or you're producing these period dramas in a world which has no black people in at all is really um, a sort of 
uh, move away from the reality of what you were seeing in society. So a really famous public figure would have been Ira Aldridge. He was an American uh, that made his career in England and Europe. He was an actor famous uh, initially for playing roles like Othello and then Aaron in uh, Titus Andronicus, um, but he acted all over Europe. Um, playing not only uh, sort of black roles in uh, Shakespearean plays, but a, a range of different roles and also uh, key figures such as King Lear he played as well. Um, he was also the first black theatre manager in England in 1828. He took over the management of the Coventry Theatre. Um, in terms of music, you have uh, sort of that tie back to the Tudor period in John Blanc. You have Joseph Emmerdy, who is a violinist and musician. Um, and he was a key figure in the music scene in Cornwall. So it, we're not just seeing people here in London or the, or the big cities. Um, now, one of the uh, sort of facts about the period is that the majority of black people either were black working poor or they were servants. And as we can see from these two sketches by William Hogarth, um, there was a fad for uh, black servants and particularly for black child servants in the 18th century, this sort of idea of an allo modality to, or fashion of having black servants as a sort of talking point, this horrifying objectification. Um, but we can see it there in uh, the Harlot's Progress. We can see the small child dressed up um, here in a, almost a costume. And then we have uh, a black servant here in the William Hogarth marriage allo modality. Um, so thinking about, uh, race and class in the period, we obviously have this sort of servant class. Um, and we do have a lot of um, integration between black uh, working class people and white working class people. So I've already mentioned there was quite a lot of intermarriage between white and black people. And there are sort of many notable instances of this or many instances of this. Uh, we also have uh, this depiction, as you can see here in the Crookshamp portrait, although here we are getting sort of a racist stereotype in the depiction um, of the black figures. What is also being naturalized is this sort of mixed lower class society. Um, <clears throat> um, and we do have some interesting sort of reports from the 18th century um, about uh, the way that class and race uh, intersected because we have the, the London magistrate, uh, John Fielding, I think, complaining about the way in which the London mob defended runaway uh, slaves, essentially. Um, another sort of interesting connection between race and class is this uh, interconnection between uh, racial uh, activists working on abolition and activists working on uh, increased suffrage and working class rights. And we see that in the case of somebody like William Davidson, but we also see it in people like uh, Aladu Equiano, for example, who was a member of the London Corresponding Society, a working class uh, activism group as well. Now, William Davidson was the son of the Attorney General of Jamaica and a black woman. He was sent uh, to uh, university in Scotland as a youth, studied to be a lawyer, entered a lawyer's uh, sort of um, employ, ran away to sea because it wasn't for him, was pressed in the Navy, then eventually was able to return back, went to university in Aberdeen this time, uh, became a cabinet maker, had this sort of uh, romance with the wealthy daughter of a wealthy merchant, uh, the, the father thought he was a fortune hunter um, and she ended up getting married to somebody else and he unfortunately tried to kill himself um, and then he uh, ended up moving to London and joining a group of radicals and he was executed by the state in 1820 for his involvement in the Cato Street conspiracy. Uh, so just a really sort of interesting life story there just to add it in. So we've thought about uh, the history of the period, but what we're wanting to do now in the discussion section is think about how uh, Bridgerton specifically deals with this um, world building and the reflection of race in the period. Um, now, before we go on, I didn't give content warnings at the beginning, so I'll give them now. We are going to be talking about um, a number of disturbing things and we're going to be starting in some of our discussion now with Bridgerton. We will give content warnings just before we talk about something uh, with the option to sort of wave in and wave back, uh, wave out and then wave back in. Um, uh, we will be talking obviously about racial violence, we'll be talking um, about some uh, violent racial stereotypes, we'll be talking about uh, uh, 
various forms of oppression and racial imagery, we're also going to be talking about uh, rape in regard to uh, Bridgerton, just to sort of give you a heads up there. But let's go back and think about Bridgerton the series and this idea of race and world building. So um, in the first three episodes, it's possible to understand this world as, uh, or the construction of uh, Bridgerton as being about colorblind casting. But in episode four, we have Lady Dan Danbury explaining how the world works and sort of relating it back to the real history, sort of. And she says, we were two separate societies divided by color until a king fell in love with one of us. Love your grace conquers all. So, Tanagra, hello. Hello. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Um, does this work um, as a piece of world building in terms of how it, yeah, how does it work, basically? Um, so, I would say that it does not work. Um, the idea that one royal falling in love with a member of a minority group, or in this case, a Black person, magically um, creating equality um, and acceptance at, and ultimately ending racism because there is no other mention of racism. Um, there's only this moment and then one other slight mention uh, that all of a sudden it's solved is um, something that we can even look to modern day uh, royal couples because we have uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle that uh, all the vitriol and racism and microaggressions that she had to deal with show that this isn't true. This is not how it works that you fall in love and then magically everybody around you is like ah oh, yes I see now we're equal and that there's no sort of um, feelings or leftover sentiments of uh, of inequality um, so no it does not work <laughs> not for me at least no I mean, I think like as a piece of logic, it doesn't work as we've discussed. And I'll just show the next slide at this point. Um, but this is a really interesting example of the time, I think that we talked about, which is, this is a caricature by James Gilray from 1788. And this is Prince William Henry, the younger brother of the region, shown with potentially Dorothy Thomas, Vanessa Riley suggests, who was um, a black woman from Jamaica who was enslaved, bought her freedom and then became a very successful, very wealthy businesswoman and brought her family out of slavery as well. Um, but this is a picture of them apparently in love with a very romantic verse, however the kind of idea of caricature is. And we do see this picture, although he's a caricaturist, this is not a caricatured representation of uh, the woman specifically buying into the same uh, caricatured features of the time. But we can see how this royal affair had zero impact on uh, race relations in the period um but yeah so we we were talking about you know the explanation doesn't doesn't work and for me what then essentially happens because it so blatantly doesn't work is it creates this idea of the diversity of the period that we see in Bridgerton as being pure fantasy um, so although there are overlaps with real life, those become as fantastical. So Will becomes as fantastical as the Duke Simon, for example. What do you reckon? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think also one of the issues here is that um, they talk about two separate societies, which is very much, I'll, I'll get into it when I talk about US history, but that's very much also a US approach. Um, there's the, there literally was how black Americans lived and how white Americans lived. And as you've shown, that's not necessarily, that wasn't necessarily the case in um, Britain at the time, but it also ignores all of the other people that aren't either black or white if there's two separate societies. Um, because, so I mentioned that there's another uh, moment where they sort of refer to race and it's with Will the Boxer and the uh, white Lord is reminding him about how his father escaped. And um, so that's why he's now free in Britain. But it's, so it's suggesting that there are colonies and that there are other peoples who are part of the British empire, yet we're only um, shown what's happening, uh, what it means to be black or what it means to be white. And they even support the idea that there are colonies because throughout the film sort of I guess wherever they needed color, pun intended. Um, there are different BIPOC and some of them are um, aesthetically appear to be 
Asian, and yet there's no talk of that. There's no talk of what uh, it means to be part of the British Empire. We're only given this view of Britain. So it's sort of this recognition of this difference, but also an erasure of anybody who doesn't fall into either you're black or you're white. Um, it's poorly done. Yeah, I think like the problem that we've talked about quite a lot between the two of us is this idea of what it erases, yes. that by making it fantastical and also basing it on this faulty logic of two separate societies, it erases a lot of real people and mm -hmm. real voices and real agency and real stories and real diversity um, that become kind of swept aside, um, I guess. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely say swept aside, um, especially because the choice to make, so because this is a Shond Shondaland production, uh, one of the hallmarks of all Shondaland productions are, are that the cast is diverse. So when they decided to adapt the Julia Quinn novels, who are, um, which are all white, um, all of her characters are white, they had to put in that um, Shondaland hallmark. So the writer actually, uh, the showrunner and also the lead writer on Bridgerton had to find a reason for there to be Black people. And I've read a couple of interviews about this because I know there's been a lot of talk about, oh, it's colorblind casting, that's great, but that's not the case. The reason they mention race is because he felt that in order to have Black people in the show, you had to justify it historically. And so uh, the, this marriage is supposed to basically be what this entire world is based on and why we're why we have Black people here. But that doesn't work because nothing else about this show is historically accurate. Um, so to choose race to be the element that you want to be the basis of your quote unquote facts, um, it in some ways makes it more racist because it's so poorly handled and the presentation of the characters and the dealing of race within the social dynamics and as we'll see within the romance. Um, if it would have been just colorblind casting, I think it would have been fine. Um, like create the full fantasy, but that's not where they went. So if you're going to say that, then you have to deal with the consequences of choosing to say now the racism of our world um, ultimately exists in this musical, you know, <laughs> musical, magical, pretty fantasy where nothing else is historically accurate. But we have to get Black representation historically accurate. Nothing else, though. Yeah. So, Although it very much wasn't historically accurate. <laughs> intensive <laughs> exactly i feel like it's it's interesting to sort of create this idea that you have to create a fantasy in order to understand kind of movement through class and black people in different positions in society and i'm not saying that um bridgerton is an accurate representation of the class makeup of the, the upper classes but you have cases like sabiese you have people like caesar picton you have these stories of how class and race and social mobility and uh, kind of ingrained racism continue to survive in the face of that. You know, you have that history there, um, yeah. but that's kind of, it, that disappears, I think, which is quite frustrating. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we wanted to look at was because we've seen this quote used to kind of combat our critique or the critique of that line and how it functions because there's this idea that, well, Simon in response comes up with this, uh, he disagrees essentially with Lady Danbury. Um, and he says, I believe that that remains to be seen. The King may have chosen his queen. He may have elevated us from novelties in their eyes to now dukes and royalty. And at the same whim, he may just as easily change his mind. A mind, as we all know, that is hanging on by one very loose and tenuous thread. So no, I'm sorry, Lady Danbury, we're in disagreement here. Love changes nothing. Um, so I do agree with his last line, love does change nothing. Good work, Simon. Well done. Um, he does go back on that later. And the text, I think, Bridgerton tries to prove Lady Danbury right. Um, but his logic here as well is problematic. It's resetting the terms of the critique. Um, and it, it doesn't quite make sense because he's suggesting that there's this flip, right? That you, you're either a novelty and that's perhaps a reference to those, uh, that sort of the fashion for black servants, for example, or black performers as well. Um, you, you're either a novelty or no racism exists and you're completely equal and you're a duke now. Um, so it's that kind of flip 
where either the you know race exists as an epistemological system a way of understanding there are race racialized ways of understanding viewing and structuring the world um, but they just dissolve but you could actually just go back to them but you could flip between them rather than understanding that you know uh, a change in position or a change in status does not equal the deconstruction of these racial epistemologies and uh, sort of structures of oppression um, including the slavery which we don't quite know doesn't exist within the empire um what would you say tanagra what would you bring out i yeah i'd agree with that and i i like we've talked a bunch and uh i've seen this quoted a lot and one thing that i really just sort of laughing out right now i'm rolling my eyes at the, the poor world building is that even though he says like right you're either um a novelty or you're a duke, but then it goes completely against the idea then that uh, black people are fully not only um, tolerated, but integrated and accepted. Because if your status and how you're viewed and your dehumanization is that easily given and taken away, and I say given in air quotes, obviously, um, then like the idea that love changes everything or that race wouldn't be something that even he and Daphne would talk about is, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite annoying at the holes that are missed there or the understanding of how, I guess, race functions um, in some ways. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, another thing also that I want to bring up, because there is the picture of the father there, is that while there's also this idea that like racism doesn't exist, and whether this is on purpose or whether this is the fault of the writers or the casting director, I'm not sure. There's also in the few black characters that we do see that are the diverse representation, there's a lot of colorism. And that's something that I don't feel is even addressed or dealt with. So the father who is abusive also, lots of, um, lots of spoilers, by the way, if you haven't seen any of the media that we're talking about, but the father is abusive. He's um, very much uh, all about social climbing. He's emotionally abusive to uh, Simon. He ignores the mom, but he's also darker skinned. And this goes into something that I'll be talking about, um, about the uh, stereotypes in the United States as well at the time, but that not only were uh, black people seen as more animalistic or unable to control their urges, but also if you were darker skinned, that also factored into that as well. And so for the father who is darker skinned to be abusive to his son who is lighter skinned gets into issues that if they can't even deal with basic racial, the idea of race, they definitely can't deal with the idea of colorism and it's never addressed. Or the fact that the only, out of all the characters who are trying to get married, out of all the women who are trying to, the only one who was an unwed pregnant mother is a light-skinned um, black woman. And there's a suggestion that she potentially could be biracial, but once again, we don't know because race doesn't exist except when it does to make a point about love. Um, and that's also the perpetuation of another uh, stereotype about um, black women. Uh, you see a little bit more of this when you talk about the French seamstress and they sort of imply because she acts like she's French when she's really not, she's British, but she does a fake French accent and she speaks and drops French words every once in a while. And the uh, idea that she's accepted as a seamstress and seemed to have a certain level of power, one, because she's French, but also because she's lighter skinned. And so the few representations that we do have of color are problematic, uh, just taking them for what they are in a production. But then when you add on this poorly done world building and how they're dealing with race, it's even more problematic. I think something that just came up to me then that was interesting when you mentioned like the seamstress and also the love conquers all is that Bridgerton does a better job with class than it does with race. And that produces a kind of cognitive dissonance because you have the relationship with Anthony. And, you know, it's made very plain there that that love does not conquer class. Yes but somehow magically love conquers racism. Yeah. Magical. magical. It is magical. Love is magic. <laughs> yes. Um, so we're moving on um, a bit 
now, uh, if you do, you think we're ready to move on to Agra? I think so. Uh, I think so. Yes. So we're going to be moving on uh, now to talk about um, specifically looking at the relationship um, and the romance in this romance, or what I would say, the horror in this romance. Uh, which is the relationship between Daphne and Simon. So content warning for this section, we are going to be discussing rape um, and we're not going to be viewing the scene of the rape itself. I do have these two images um, and we will be looking at the scene just after. So, um, you know, do feel free to, to sort of mute if you have to. Um, so we wanted to uh, sort of think about the way that this relationship is portrayed. We're thinking about episode six um, and the sort of backstory to this is that Simon uh, has made a vow not to have children. Um, he has told Daphne that he can't have children um, and she has discovered that he physically can. And so she makes a plan to um, essentially uh, continue the sexual act without his consent. Um, he makes it plain in the scene. He says, wait, wait. So he withdraws consent in the context of the scene uh, to the to the act itself. Um, and uh, so we, we have this scene effectively um, of uh, sexual assault or rape. Um, and I've picked two screenshots here because I think that they uh, sort of reproduce the problematics of this scene very clearly. Um, and it's a problematic that is made uh, much worse uh, by the issue, not much worse, but it's made worse or it, uh, it's added to by the issue of race as well. Um, so Tanagra, you're the film person. Uh, what were your sort of responses to the, like, the way this was shot or the way this was set up or how this scene worked? I mean, if this was um, a horror film, I'd be like, oh, it shot really well. Um, but because it's supposed to be two people in love, even if they're fighting, having sex, I find it very disturbing. Um, the angles of the camera are, so there's there's other scenes, there's other sex scenes in Bridgerton that you can compare this to, to see how the angles of the camera and also the lighting differ. So in this one, you have, the camera is down looking up at Daphne to emphasize the fact that she's looking over Simon, that she is hovering over him. Um, then you have Simon's face who very much is being stared down on, also capturing his expression of surprise and- Distress. A lot of things. Yeah, distress, horror, disbelief. Um, yes, and then um, while going back to Daphne, while she's over Simon, you also have the fact that you can't fully see her face. And this is a co common horror technique, right? You don't, you don't see the horror, you don't see what's causing the fear. And it's half of her face is in the dark, half of her face is in the light, almost looks like they overexposed it, which is something that um, you'll see in horror a lot, basically just makes the footage darker, yet you don't lose any of the sharpness. And it looks technically great, but what it's conveying is not a woman who is in love with the man she is looming over, staring at him from the darkness, um, like she is going to take control over him and that she uh, that she can also. And uh, the facial expression just sort of adds to, adds to the creepiness of it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when we talk as well about sort of right, how perhaps race impacts on this and uh, sort of adds to it, the sort of dynamic of her looming over him and him sort of there very prone, um, sort of uh, very vulnerable as well. Um, so some of the discussion about Bridgerton has talked about this scene very disturbingly as sort of like a reclamation of a female power. Um, I think that's a terrible reading under any circumstances, um, but I also think that if you're reproducing it in the, this context of race, it's very much uh, ignoring those race relations as well. And it's ignoring this kind of uh, sexualization and exploitation um, of the black male body that we're seeing here. Um, so I think that that makes it uh, this very sort of strange and disturbing power fantasy, if it is a power fantasy, which becomes the power fantasy of the white woman over the prone black male body. Um, yeah. Don't know if you have anything to add to Nagra or if we should just go on to the scene. What do you think? Yes, I think we should go on to what's next. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, screen share and we're going to watch a clip from Bridgerton. Um, it's just after this has, has occurred. It is still a very, very disturbing scene and um, you can, uh, content warnings for gaslighting certainly and abusive behavior. So uh, let me just share it with you guys. Um, one second. It will take a little second to load on the Netflix because my internet is like two things at once. Um, let me just pause as well. I'm going to pause the recording to, to watch the clip, but this is from season six and it's the last, uh, it's at 7.40 uh, from the end. And we're back from watching the clip. Tanagra. <laughs> <laughs> just the false equivalency that she immediately jumps to between the he lied, therefore it's justified that she rape him is like, no, just like you could have talked to him. You could have asked him about this, like, but that you thought it, it was the right thing to do to um, take advantage of him when you're in bed, which uh, if you've watched this, you know, like they're, they're always sleeping together. Like by this time, they're always sleeping together. There's a lot of trust when it comes to their sexual intercourse, which is one reason why she's so upset. But once again, that doesn't justify rape. Um, and the face that he's making is, I believe it's right after he says, wait, wait. So in, you can, there is a, there can be a difference legally between sexual assault and then also forced impregnation. But the reason why that argument doesn't ultimately work here is because while he does consent at the beginning of the sexual act, when he says, wait, wait, ultimately he's revoking consent. So whether you're saying, oh, well, he, he consented to sex, he just didn't want to get her pregnant. No, because when he says, wait, wait, he says, stop. And like, we all know, wait, wait, doesn't mean keep going. It means stop, therefore revoking consent and no longer wanting to engage in sex. But you see her face and she does keep going. And so there's no way to even try and justify it, that maybe she didn't know, that maybe he was okay with the sex, but not with the... Um, impregnation or ejaculating inside of her like he doesn't want any of that to happen and that after he's shocked and asking her what she did she then turns around and is like well you lied to me just is absolutely mind-blowing that somehow this is seen as an as acceptable um and I know a lot of that does definitely play into the fact that we don't talk about male rape a lot but I, I really do feel that consent is um something that's constantly being talked about these days and how you don't see it's not in the scene is very disturbing to me because after this then she starts crying as though she's the victim not him yeah I mean one thing we'll talk about when we get to get out is how there's a lot of like equivalency between how Daphne behaves and how Rose behaves in get out and we hear we see here this kind of flip in the the terms of the discourse and also you see this flip into kind of the weaponization of her apparent fragility um, to yes. undermine uh, Simon, undermine his position and uh, victim blame very effectively. Um, but what is most horrifying, I think, about the way this is represented in Bridgerton is that the narrative agrees with Daphne and it produces sympathy for Daphne. And if you watch this scene, my sympathy is very much with Simon, like the what did you do is heartbreaking. His face here is heartbreaking. And yet the production as a whole produces this concept of sympathy specifically for Daphne, I think, which is, yeah, disturbing. Yeah, completely. I mean, from this point on, it's all about how Daphne has suffered because he lied, how Daphne can't have children because he lied. Although there's an entire scene where she talks about, she's fine not having children. But now that she knows it's a possibility, it's okay for her to do this and be upset about it. Um, and it's it's even more troubling because also this, since this is an adaptation from the book, right, this scene didn't have to be kept. Um, and it's even controversial in the book because uh, it's more problematic in the book uh, because he's drunk when it happens. But then to keep that scene in an adaptation, in a modern adaptation also, because um, there are problematic issues in romance, but a lot of times they'll um, delete them or they'll remove them, you know, if, as, if a book gets updated. And in this case, the book is updated into an entire show and they could have done the same thing, yet they not only chose to not remove it, um, 
I think the system is supposed to do better because he's fully awake and sober, but then they also added the racial element on top of it. Um, and it has definitely been justified both by the author, Julia Quinn, who wrote the novels, the Bridgerton novels and like the entire series. Um, and she was also part of uh, the writing staff for this show. Um, and as Sam was saying, the idea that Daphne is taking back her power is part of the justification that has been offered for why this scene is necessary and the uh, context. Once again, people citing historical accuracy. I can only do air quotes so much trying to justify uh, what is problematic. Yeah. And the old historically, historical accuracy argument that gets dragged out to defend problematic elements yes. rather than being used as we are hopefully discussing it today to kind of reevaluate, re-understand the past and deconstruct some of the false narratives that have been produced about the past. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's our discussion. Um, I'm gonna come out of that shared screen there, guys. Um, and uh, passing it over, uh, we are 10 minutes ahead of our time from this morning. So doing well, Tanagra. Um, any questions, any things that people want to bring up and discuss with us? in relation to this. Rish, I saw your microphone. Um, yeah. Now, uh, I realized something re-watching the scenes and whatnot, which struck me initially when I watched the first episode, is that I have no idea how old the actors themselves are, but Daphne has this look of like early teenagerhood. I don't know, maybe that's just my perception of what the actress looks like, but she looks really young. And when you bring in the racial elements, that stands out really uncomfortably for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this whole argument <laughs> yeah. about age and in, in um, period romance as well, isn't there? That's almost like a, an extra topic. But what do you think, Tanagra? Yeah. No, I, d I would uh, definitely agree with that. Um, I mean, in, so in real life, they're fairly close in age, but she also is supposed to look like um, a young teenager who is just being introduced into society. And so trying to balance that, um, also something that they probably should have considered in the casting, I'll say, yeah. which was not obviously considered. Yeah. Christopher? Um, yeah, I was wondering um, when they when they decided to write it the way they did with the oversimplified way of um, explaining away um, the integration of, of black characters in, in particular, I was wondering like, because they see this type of like oversimplification in like all kinds of narratives, be it black people, um, BIPOC people, even queer narratives is like always like this this way in which these narratives are oversimplified. And I was wondering, is it just because, so that the presumed audience is like not as uncomfortable as they might get when, you know, if they were, if they were confronted with more nuanced characters or more, um, more like nuanced narratives, I'm just like, I'm always baffled. It always just baffles me. And it's just like so frustrating sometimes because it's like, how difficult is it to write nuanced characters and narratives and like, I know, I know what, uh, yeah, just, sorry, just a little tiny rent. <laughs> uh, no, I'd say that's a, a valid rant um, and critique because I would agree. I think that's constantly an issue. Um, and it's not like, you know, this isn't, particularly in this case, it's not like money was a problem, right? So they were like, oh, we're on this tight schedule or else we won't be able to film this. Like, no, that's not it. You could have taken the time and written a better adaptation and worked race into uh, the story. Why it's not done, um, I feel it definitely does have something to do with the audience and trying to make the audience comfortable. I think this is something that actually comes up a lot more when we're going to be talking about Get Out. Um, Get Out is one of the few films um, that I know in Hollywood, and I'm really trying to think of others, that was actively written for a Black audience that um, and the director has said that uh, Jordan Peele is very, de very definitely, like definitively, excuse me, stated that. And you don't usually get that, um, even when um, BIPOC or LGBTQIA uh, creatives are making entertainment. 
they very rarely are like, yeah, I don't really care if anybody outside of my group gets this. It's only for the people who identify the way that I do. There's always this necessity um, as a creative and a minority um, who is a minority to make what you're creating not only accessible to the people who you want to speak to and who you want to represent, but also to the white cis, uh, white cis majority at large. Um, and uh, even with Get Out, uh, Jordan Peele wrote it for five years and then he never expected to get it funded because that's just the reality of, of the industry. So valid critique, but um, I don't see it getting better anytime soon. That's my <laughs> positive note I'm gonna end my response on. Yeah. Um, I mean, um... I'll just, are you all right with me answering the question, Rish? Did you yeah, to... no, I have a question kind of. I'll go through, it. maybe go through the ones in the chat first, just because they, no, no worries. Okay. But I'll just sort of add from the historian perspective, which is a different perspective. Um, I think in terms of adaptation, um, and I'll tie it in with uh, CM, your question or your idea here. I think like there is a, a sort of, broader lack of historical knowledge or the wish to really engage with and contextualize it. So the idea that you, um, uh, you know, you are often making it comfortable for an audience in producing something like Bridgerton, but um, that sort of emphasis on uh, understanding historical adaptation and how uh, kind of that interaction between adaptation and history works and kind of thinking through those aspects of world building, etc don't necessarily always get um, appreciated or thought out. And I think like we, we discussed this this morning a little bit in that this was a production made by people who weren't really romance writers or readers necessarily uh, on a larger scale. Um, and it shows in terms of they're definitely not at the forefront of what romance can be doing and often is doing with representations of race or queerness or class, you know? Um, because there's there's some elements of it where there's this dismissal of the question because oh it's romance or it's fantasy or it works like this so there's this um, you know maybe a failure to engage in in all of these questions of the complexity of how you represent the past and I think in terms of your question um, CM uh, I think the answer to that representation of black boxes because there were there were a lot of black boxes you know um, there were there were black fighters in England and there were sort of uh, some of the most famous boxers of the period were black. Um, so to delete them from history is deleting history, but to put them in as we find in Bridgerton without that sort of historical context and understanding it and relating back the, the sort of uh, the status of these black boxers, both as uh, sort of uh, kind of stars in a sense but also uh, relating them back to these uh, these stereotypes and how uh, this was one of the avenues uh, which they could find employment and stardom in because uh, this because of those racist discourses of, of violence for example or etc you know you have to look at the history and the context to really do any justice to it and if you remove it from the context you risk reproducing the sort of the symbolism of the fighter, the, the black fighter as violent, for example. Do you see what I mean? Like if you include the historical context and you engage with the nuance and the fact that, you know, this career was possible because of this or, um, and the reaction of the public and how kind of race impacted the depiction of these account, uh, the depiction of these matches or the support for these fighters, um, you have to engage with that. Otherwise you are going to fall into uh, really problematic representation. Um, so, Rish, did you have a question? I, I don't know if you saw Angie's question, Tanagra, and I don't know if you have any answers because I don't. Because I haven't oh. read anything more that actually properly addresses it. Um, so this sort of came up this morning that the, the loudest... Uh, the loudest voice when it comes to Bridgerton, and uh, apologies, my heat might come on, which will um, admit a high-pitched squeal. Uh, I have steam heat, so, um, so apologies if y'all hear that. But uh, the loudest voice when it comes to critiquing, or I won't even say critiquing, but rather talking about Bridgerton has been people who are fans of it, 
So um, there, they really haven't been pressed to actually have to discuss the racial issues outside of the few questions that they were asked about. Um, and even then it was always the showrunner and the head writer. And his response was that he was upset that people thought it was colorblind casting. But mostly because as Sam was saying, people were like, oh, it's romance. Like there's this dismissive um, approach to the entire genre that since it's romance, you don't need to look into these racial issues. And I think the fact also that um, Sean, Shonda Rhimes said herself that she wasn't a fan of romance. Uh, Bridgerton was one of the first romance books that she ever read. And so that uh, she also, that has a very limited awareness of romance and what it can be and how diverse it is and that there are non-problematic authors um, just sort of plays into it that if their fans aren't telling them, they're not gonna see it. And the only person who ever really responded publicly to any of the critique, and it's a very small contingent of us who dislike Bridgerton um, and are very loud about it being racist. Um, it was their PR uh, marketing manager. And all he said was Shonda Rhimes was not the person who wrote the scripts. So you should attribute it to um, the white male writer who was a showrunner. And that's, that was it. Um, yeah, but Shonda Rhimes did say that she read all the scripts and approved them. So I, I wish there was, I feel like if we were still having conventions, you know, they, there'd be a Bridgerton panel, the showrunner would be there and then they'd get caught on the spot. So at times I miss conventions, well, I miss them a lot, but definitely in situations like this, because when you're live and in front of an audience, you have to answer the question because it is a valid question. If you actively chose to put race in, why didn't you handle it better? Um, but you know, we're not having conventions. And so I don't know if anybody will ever ask because none of the interviews have have brought it up or they'll talk about it. Um, they'll talk about it in their critique of the show, but not when they're actually speaking to somebody who was on the creative staff, which is very frustrating in all honesty, especially because season two already got uh, greenlit. So I think it did officially. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, it'll get better. Rish, did you have a question you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's a question so much as a comment, but um, the other thing with uh, what Christopher mentioned about the simplification of narratives, not just in Bridgerton and not just around race, but in general, mm -hmm. is I often wonder whether like not just TV shows, but like books and stuff think that audience does not want to be challenged mm. like what I frequently go back to is um the publishing decision to change the name of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone to Sorcerer's Stone mm. and um the the reasoning given that the American audience would not be able to understand what a philosopher was wait <laughs> so I I I frequently go back to you know like sometimes I just wonder whether people in media think their audience does not want to be challenged in any way whatsoever I mean I think that happens right I think people presume that people don't want challenge um, I think particularly in a genre like romance where you know you have a lot of the defense of Bridgerton is like well leave it alone it doesn't have to be historically accurate it's fantasy and I, I totally agree with that you know romance any historical fiction is a historical fantasy but we have to engage with the fact that this is a real history with real people in it like that history existed and real people existed and uh, the way in which we adapt and represent those periods of time um, are rooted in a reality, are connected to a reality that we have to um, engage with, whether we're going to create a bubble of fantasy and do some uh, world building around it and reimagine, produce an alternate history that we have built thoroughly, you know, um, or whether we're going to try and reflect those realities and their complexity, like we have to engage with it, I think, for me. And those kind of, well, it doesn't really matter, it's meant to be fantasy, it's romance, etc. doesn't really work for me um i also i honestly think as a historian that there's a lot of like uh very unnuanced conceptions of history there's i mean you saw it in the paper today in england right where you have 
the government calling together 25 heritage bodies in order to say, you know, stop saying bad things about Britain, essentially. Um, so you have this, you know, these very simplistic historical narratives existing more broadly um, that, you know, people just don't necessarily have the knowledge or they don't have the um, uh, sort of context to really kind of work through these realities. Yeah. Um, I would just also add that, like, there is always the option to not engage, but if you're not going to engage with the histories and the histories and the contexts of the world that we live in, then you have to fully disengage from it. Um, this morning, somebody brought up the wonderful example of Cinderella with uh, Brandy, and it's completely colorblind casting. Like, the queen is um, black, she's Whoopi Goldberg, the father, the king is white, uh, Victor Garber, and then their son, I just blanked on his name, and I literally just watched the, um, they were just talking about the uh, the reunion, and, um, but thank you, Paolo Montalban, yeah, thank you. Um, he's um, Filipino, and he was a, a Broadway star, like, if you don't want to engage with the real world, you don't have to, but the moment that you choose to, then you have to deal with all of it and its complexities. And I do think that there can be sometimes a belief that uh, a belief that the um, public either doesn't want something or is maybe too dumb to understand it. But I don't think that I don't think that means that we shouldn't do it as as creatives. Like if it's if the public doesn't want to engage with it, well, then maybe they just don't watch your media, or maybe they do watch it and they learn something. But to be like, oh, it's too difficult, that's that's BS, especially when you're talking about companies like Netflix that have the money and have the resources to actually have hired historians, right? Like to actually do this research for them, to have read over all of the scripts and said, oh, this is accurate, this is not. Like they found the money to hire musicians to rewrite Nicki Minaj and pop songs um, into instrumentals, but not to look up uh, the racial history of Britain, like there, that was an act of choice. So, yeah. also okay. excellent on the rewatch. Sorry. <laughs> um. Yes, I didn't. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um. Definitely. Like you have to disengage entirely, or you have to accept the responsibilities of engagement. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, Dan, I've not actually watched Harlots fully. It's on my list. Um, I think that from what I've heard about it, I think that it takes an approach that is more in line with what I would like to see, which is engagement with that historical period and depicting its diversity. Um, but um, I also like the idea of not having to be explicitly justified, but I'll have to get back to you when I've seen it for a kind of proper uh, breakdown of it. I don't know if you've seen it, Tanagra. I... I've only watched like half of the first season and not past that. So I, as Bridgerton has shown, you have to watch all of it before you can judge. Yes. Those embarrassing like, oh, Bridgerton's, oh no. <laughs> Moments yeah. halfway through. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. I <laughs> think, <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, a little of Bridgerton goes a very long way. Um, uh, so I think just time-wise, guys, we're probably going to move on to the next section. But if you have a remaining question, Christopher, pop it in the chat. And because it's uh, Tanagra that will be going on with this, I can answer it and then Tanagra can answer it when she gets back, baby. Um, so as I said, it's a long one today, guys. It's a long one. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Tanagra, who's going to be sharing um, the second part with you now. Okay. Rearranging. All right. Oh, wait, hold on. I know how to use Zoom, y'all. Okay. So the 